how do you review a film like 2001 A Space Odyssey and not become outrageously pretentious at the same time? A film that starts with the dawn of man, visits the moon and then ends with a head trip without the criminal record. Time to stamp fine it. <laughs> By the mid-1960s, American director Stanley Kubrick was sitting pretty. He'd had success after success with films like Paths of Glory, Spartacus, Lolita, and most recently, Dr. Strangelove. He'd also become fascinated with the concept of aliens and decided he wanted to make a science fiction film, but one unlike every other science fiction film made to that point. He wanted to make one that wasn't complete shit. Most science fiction films that had been released by the mid-60s were either cheap and nasty B-movies or cheap and cheerful B-movies. Every now and then you'd have a decently budgeted film do okay, but they were rare. Either way, they had a lousy reputation within the industry. Kubrick used his clout to get MGM to underwrite his sci-fi film. Kubrick, of course, is a genius. There are different types of geniuses. There are ones who have the entire vision in their heads, and then there's the other sort, the ones who need collaborators to plant ideas into their head, the genius vampire. Kubrick was of the latter variety. On the film eventually released as 2001, Kubrick collaborated with noted science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke on crafting a story that would depict alien influence on human development. Kubrick, not intentionally by all accounts, was that guy who didn't know what he wanted until you gave him 1,000 options so he could work out what he wanted. The line between genius and dickhead is a very fine one. Great for him, a pain in the ass for everyone else who was burned out as a result. But we're not here to count the bodies. 2001 has five different sections. The introduction is set millions of years ago when ape creatures are chilling in Africa and come across a black rectangular block that's just sitting there. The block or monolith somehow inspires the ape man to use tools. Cut to millions of years later, a guy who's like the head of NASA without calling it NASA, so Dr. Haywood Floyd, the head of I can't believe it's not NASA, is traveling to the US base on the moon. It takes a while for the film to drip feed the audience information, like cross-examining a hostile witness or trying to make small talk with that person who stares at the office microwave for three minutes while the lasagna heats up. But we learn that something's been found on the moon, a monolith like the one we saw poking the apes. It emits a piercing sound, a radio transmission aimed at Jupiter, cut to 18 months later to the ship Discovery on its way to Jupiter. On board are astronauts Dave Bowman and Frank Poole, along with three colleagues in suspended animation, which is like being asleep without dreaming, or like living in Britain. The mission is more or less run by the ship's computer, HAL 9000. Good evening, Dave. How are you doing, HAL? Everything's running smoothly, and you? Oh, not too bad. And even if the idea of the all-powerful computer going mad is an old hat by now, 2001 was one of the earliest examples of this idea in a film. It can only be attributable to human error. This sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human error. Hal starts killing off the crew with all the intensity of a panini press. Hal going nuts doesn't suddenly start using slang or spouting pithy one-liners. He's exactly as he was before. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. And that's what's so utterly creepy about it. It's like getting Siri to read you your death threats. Hey, you sucker. I hope you fall down the stairs, you stupid idiot. Best regards, Bill 9000. Still, when Hal is deactivated, it's the most emotional scene in a film that's often characterized as lacking emotion. It's profoundly sad, like when you have to turn off your phone for the last time before you stick it in a drawer with all your previous phones. I can sing it for you. Yes, I'd like to hear it, Hal. Sing it for me. And another one gone, and another one gone. Another one bites the dust. And it's at that point you start wondering whether you should start treating those Boston Dynamics videos as portentous horror films. In a film that's been fairly stingy in terms of telling you what's going on, Hayward Floyd pops up to explain just what's been going on, just as Dave has switched off the malfunctioning Hal. However, Bowman never thinks to turn Hal back on again to see if he's suddenly fixed. So they didn't predict that then, did they? The fourth section is where surviving astronaut Bowman makes contact with a monolith near Jupiter, and that's where shit gets real. 
Known as the Stargate sequence, we are treated to the then groundbreaking slit scan animation technique, along with aerial sequences with deliberately mistreated colors and some of the earliest sequences filmed by Kubrick back in New York of paint and solvents being dripped into a tank. Were they on drugs when they made this? Probably not. The real question is, how about you? The final section is Dave Bowman having made it through the Stargate, finding himself in a weird house, part period, part futuristic, and seeing versions of himself at different ages, ending with Bowman as an embryo or star child. Stand fine. F you. I have photos of you. Haha, ha. you should not have given me permissions to access your camera. In the end, the film raises more questions than it answers. And there were two schools of reactions from viewers. One was, whoa, man. And the other was, hmm, what the hell was all that about, Ethel? 2001 has amazing special effects, not just for its time, but full stop. It's not quite done all in camera, but like Blade Runner, you'll still find it hard to spot the joins, even in glorious 4K. Even though it was the work of many effects artists such as pioneer Douglas Trumbull, Kubrick was the sole winner of an Oscar for this film's visual effects. It was in fact his only Academy Award. It's like that time you got dressed up to go to a fancy dinner party and the host just orders Pizza Hut yet still expects you to give them the fancy bottle of wine. The music in this film is unusual in that it's known as a needle drop, basically all pre-existing and not specially composed as almost all movie soundtracks were. Kubrick sent an assistant to buy up different records to use, ostensibly as a temporary score, but it's those tracks that were used in the final film, even if Kubrick went through the motions of bringing on a composer to placate the studio until he could get permission to use the recordings he wanted. This guy was a genius or a brilliant jerk. He could have just saved money by getting Spotify Premium. A word that's not used to describe the film is emotion. It's there, but incredibly subdued. When Hayward Floyd is talking to his staff on the moon, no one says, hey, I'm not sure about this. No one questions the directive, even in private. Likewise, later on the discovery, Frank and Dave are incredibly mellow. Dave doesn't lose his shit at any point, only slightly raising his voice when Hal starts his back chat. Hal. That's not me. The minute I got back from a spacewalk to retrieve the supposedly faulty AE-35 Hal was going on about and found that there was nothing wrong, I would have ejected Hal's core into the sun and been onto customer service in an instant. Though I suppose that seven minute time delay would have been killer. So yeah, geniuses are great and all, but they have a habit of leaving behind a mass of their colleagues' desiccated corpses. But Stanley Kubrick was so nice about it. His intransigence was in service of the film. Genius vampires are everywhere today not just film directors, often they have the title creative director. Anyone else think these stamp fine videos aren't actual reviews? Reaction to the film at the time was split along generational lines. Basically, older people hated it and younger people loved it. Okay, Boomer, except it was the Boomers who got it. Kubrick followed up 2001 with a few films such as A Clockwork Orange, Barry Lyndon, The Shining, Full Metal Jacket and Eyes Wide Shut all controversial in different ways, all adaptations of other writers' work, and all made completely in the UK as Kubrick hated travelling. Possibly because he hated seeing the airline version of Dr. Strangelove, which is about five minutes long. 2001. It's long, it's ponderous and beautiful. It's not really a drama, so it doesn't understand what the concept of conflict is. It's not really an art film, because it does have a story. It has two legacies, every second Netflix film about a mission to Mars where something goes wrong, and every good science fiction film we've seen since. 2001 is in fact my earliest memory of seeing a movie in a cinema, when it was re-released in the wake of Star Wars. I think I was about four, and I didn't like it very much. I probably didn't appreciate it and enjoyed the film till I was much, much older. Arthur C. Clarke wrote a few sequels in 2001, one of which was turned into a film in 1984, 2010, The Year We Make Contact, directed by Peter Hyams, starring Roy Scheider as Floyd, along with Bob Balaban, Helen Mirren, John Lithgow, and a returning Kia Delia. It's a completely different kind of film, but one I like a lot. Totally serious, big-budget science fiction films have only recently come back into vogue, with movies like Gravity, Interstellar, Arrival, Thor Ragnarok, and The Martian. Sorry, sorry, Arrival doesn't belong in that list. 2001 A Space Odyssey, even though it wasn't received well by critics upon release, is now recognised as one of the greatest films of all time. Even though there is another 1968 science fiction film with fake apes that's just a little bit more fun. If you have enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Leave a comment below or check out one of our other videos.